Welcome to Digging, a podcast where we dig into the heads of creators. In this series, we're focusing on the spark, the very beginning of inspiration for an artist, where it comes from, what you do with it, and where you go with it. We're aiming to focus on how and why artists get into their field. So if anyone is listening and wants to pursue music or art or writing professionally, these are the stories of people who have pursued it, how they did it, and then how little money they have now they've started. But please do not give up. If you are just getting into this, you are our beacons of hope and we are the wretches of evil clawing from the darkness at the fountain of youth. We aim for this to be as inspirational as possible, despite that previous sentence. Luke Saxton is a York-based songwriter whose playing style spreads him over several genres, including acoustic, uh, pop music, folk music, instrumental music, art, pop, rock, baroque, baroque, uh, odd pop, I'm just, I'm sort of making some of these up, but there's definitely Beatles influences, Beach Boys, Harry Nilsson, Nick Drake, and uh, lots more, I'm not really sure where I'm going with baroque pop, but it's, it's sort of like a, um, he incorporates a lot of earlier stars into his music, there's 60s influences, but it doesn't make it sound like a retro record. Um, and he produces all his own music, which I've always been incredibly impressed by. Um, uh, these songs compile themselves on his albums to make uh, overall something really quite unique. His songs retain a sense of Britishness, which we talk about in this episode, while also including uh, more transatlantic influences, with whole albums refusing to be tied down to one genre. Uh, in this episode... Um, we actually, this is the first one we've done in ages, which is face to face. First one ever? This is the first one we've ever, ever done that's face to face. There's a distinct quality between our microphones, because I've only got one good microphone, which I'm speaking to now. In this one, in this um, event, I gave it to Luke, so I spoke into my phone. And it was a nice idea, but it doesn't sound as good. So uh, my voice sounds a bit crackly and crumbly, so apologies in advance if it's in any way off putting. But luckily I don't do too much talking and Luke has a very relaxing, lovely voice. It was a pleasure to edit this episode, not just because of the content, but also due to the timbre of his dulcet Yorkshire tones. So in this episode we talk about how Luke has always written music, very much. In recent memory he's always been a songwriter, not just releasing songs um, online for others, but often just for himself. Songs that are not played to anyone else never written down, never recorded, but often just played loud and disappearing into the ether, which I love and I'm fascinated by, and we can talk about that a little bit later on. In the meantime, here's a stupid song, which has definitely not transcended into the ether, about swear words and their existence within the following chat. If anyone is listening to this podcast that we made, if anyone is listening and they might be underage, And please be aware that there are some naughty words If you don't know them now, you will by the end Well, as a first question um, Because the music that's going to be playing just before We're talking now is going to be the stupid uh, little uh, naughty words song that I've done And you say that you used to write um, similar songs with a pal Almost as like a musical introduction, I guess Yeah, how old old was Uh, we were 13, and I just learned how to use Audacity. Oh, yeah, great and software. I begged my mum to take me to Curry's to get, like, a £10 microphone <laughs> that said on and off in, like, with this little sticker that started to peel off. And, yeah, we just used to sit and... Well, one of them was one sh- cup of sugar in the morning, which was... A classic. That's, that's what we all love to say. Lovely, sweet, so... <laughs> Lovely, sweet, sugar, sensational in my mouth. <laughs> is, that the, is that the Yeah, way? yeah. Um, can you give us a rendition? Uh, I don't think I can. No. Oh, that's a shame. You can't, you can't tease us like that, but I, <laughs> I understand. Also, it sounds, it's the sort of thing that, could, that people could hijack for like copyright reasons. Yeah. And then start utilizing I don't want to give, give too much away. Yeah, exactly. Especially not to a sugar company that mm-hmm. is like looking for the new jingle. But that's nice. <laughs> so well, like, it's almost like you... like. Um, like a childish fascination with what's immediately catchy, which I, yeah. I I always hear one in your songs and two in songs like Paul McCartney's songs on like that the later end of Abbey Road and stuff where he's yeah. sort of like singing 
uh, Her Majesty and stuff yeah. like that. They're all seem like they're 20 second long songs, but they're great. And they're just sort of like little music, music hall songs. They're like little gems. Yeah, little exactly. Little golden nuggets. And the bass line's always yeah. like boom, 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 boom. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't know why there's something so sort of like tilting and lovely mm. and also quite British about Very that. British. I found yeah. that a lot. So, um... I'll have to listen to your new album. It was one of the things I noted down, like a sort of quite an English-British mood to some of the pieces, especially in the yeah. instrumentals. Stuff like that Sunday Blues track is really lovely and Nick Drake-esque, I thought, ah, sort yeah. of like those beautiful, almost Baroque melodies. But do you find there's a certain Britishness, Englishness to your writing? I would say so, even though I'm sort of more influenced by American artists. Yeah, oh, yeah, that was, another, that was think, another thing I was going to ask. Yeah, yeah, but I think it sort of just comes out in the way it comes out. I'm not particularly... Like, I don't I don't think what I listen to kind of portrays how I sound, particularly. Mm. I mean, it does to an extent, but, yeah, I think you can tell I'm from England. I, I, don't, yeah. I don't think you'd ever necessarily go out of your way to write an English song. No. Here is an English <laughs> song. But there's just... Um, I think the imagery that you use and some of the... Turns of phrase. I don't know if yeah. I got this lyric right, but on that mother in May is the lyric "Mum of a lean, clean sex machine." Right? Yeah, that's such a good line. That's one of my <laughs> favourites. Where did that one come from? Uh, I think that's one of the lines I write when I was thinking that I want to write something that I wouldn't usually write. Yeah, okay, cool. Or that people wouldn't expect from me. Yeah, it sounded quite a brave choice to keep in almost. Lean, mean sex machine. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. it's. I always have a friend of mine in mind who's who was, I think he would admit, a bit of a womaniser back in the day. Oh, back like, in the day? No, but a few years ago. I mean, I'm not old. But, um, <laughs> in our, like, late adulthood. Yeah. Like, 19, 20. Yeah. He was, yeah. But I always kind of think of him, when I'm writing songs, as just a subject of someone else who's a male, who's not like me at all, in that respect. And, uh, but yeah. it's kind of like, boy, be careful, don't go breaking their hearts, like, don't do damage to women in that sort of way. Yeah, exactly. There's definitely like a clear moral like, message to it, but then. Footboy, kind of. Yeah, that's, yeah, that a very modern, um, yeah. a very modern term, but like quite a, kind of an age old problem that I feel yeah, you've, I you've, ta so. you've tackled as a balance between the two. Yeah. Almost, right? I, I really <laughs> like that. Um, there's. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, it sort of takes, like, a bravery. You said it's maybe out of your comfort zone, a line like that. Yeah, but... especially when I'm showing it to my mum. Yeah, exactly. Someone like that, and they kind of... I don't know, I feel like, oh, the line's coming up. We're sat here listening to the song and feeling a bit awkward. <laughs> and then I, the line comes, yeah. lean, mean sex machine, and I'm just, like, <laughs> pull, pulling strange faces. And yeah, exactly. Hoping I've got yeah. away with it. Who wrote that line? <laughs> Uh, I used to have that when I was watching Skins with my parents, if that's yeah. any consolation. No, it's the same kind of thing. It's like if you're watching a film, there's a sex scene. Yeah. And everyone just kind of goes... Yeah. Mm. Have to pretend like you don't know what it is. <laughs> yeah, this what's is going strange. on there? Why are they that's hug pretty disgusting. Why are they hugging yeah. so hard? <laughs> yeah, Mum? A bit sweaty. Yeah, exactly. How do you, do you find that if you were playing the music to uh, like cl your close family and stuff that there's you, you feel like a reservation in what you'll play to them is there is yeah. there a limit to oh the songs yeah that definitely play? Yeah. yeah i wish there wasn't but there is <laughs> but yeah. they hear them anyway right? even though if you're releasing them yeah i feel like i feel like you've just got to accept that you're going to write stuff that's going to be embarrassing yeah uh definitely to be in a room or even just to play a like live, just sitting there playing the songs, and you think, yeah, this line's coming up, and uh, I've got family members in the audience, and I feel a bit awkward about it. Yeah. There was a line in in your heart on my first album that was released that was making love at night, sleeping on her chest, and I always found I even changed the line actually when I played it live. If my family members were there, I said <laughs> I changed the line to playing chess at night. <laughs> Which yeah. is also like a really nice way to describe sex, right? <laughs> Playing chess at Playing night. Playing chess, it sounds sort of. Uh, hopefully not like as ma manipulative. <laughs> yeah, hopefully not as competitive, but it's like yeah. it's, it's almost a nice version. Well, uh, uh, a, a nice sort of link to that is. There wasn't um, anything profound behind it. it was, no, well, that's the thing. <laughs> it was just sort of, uh, a replacement the, word. The, just uh, Phoebe Bridges' first forward. album is called Stranger in the Alps, which is a, a title I really like, but it turns out it came from. Um, in a line in the Big Lebowski where they had to 
when they had to censor it. Great film. That great film. And there's a line where John Goodman says, um, uh, have, have you ever wanted to fuck a stranger in the ass? And they had to change it to, have you ever wanted to sleep with a stranger in the Alps? <laughs> which, the Alps. <laughs> which, yeah, which is sort of like their own version That's of a swear word. word, which is like what you've done. It's yeah. like playing chess. It's like a, 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 a very... Um, PG version of your yeah, own lyric. Right? I'm, I'm very sensitive to being PG. <laughs> I think I don't know why. I don't think. Well, there's a universality. Like I, I've started swearing a bit more in songs, and part of me is like, yeah, cool, swearing, sick. And another <laughs> part of me is like, I don't know. There's like maybe there's some uh, younger people or people who don't like, you know, curse words as much that won't yeah. enjoy the music as much, and it feels like. I think it probably comes from my parents. You know, like mm. my dad. If we're watching a film, my dad will just start saying, "Oh God." Oh, they're saying they have. Oh, this is horrible. Like, he just gets so sensitive about it. The older generation tend to get very uh, upset by yeah. that. Even that, like, we watched The Big Lebowski, and my dad walked out of the room after five, ten minutes because there's so many. There's so, yeah, there's so much swearing. It's like yeah. an art form oh, in that yeah. film, using the F word. It's, Definitely. Not, it's not like they're just putting Fs in there for no reason. <laughs> my, uh, my nan. Uh, walked out of four weddings and a funeral in the first five minutes because there's a scene in which they're late for a wedding and the opening scene is just fuck, 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 fuck. Yeah. It's like the only dialogue. Oh, and she, no, she, walked, she walked out of the cinema because she thought it would be a sort of like a pleasant tale about, well, marriage and yeah. I guess a little death. But no, she's not. She's not all right with the F word. Um, yeah, that's, that's an interesting one. Do you... Uh, I'm going to go to one of my classic questions do you remember what compelled you to write your first song and i guess in this instance not necessarily just the songs that you were writing with your friend uh sort of yeah. like these these fake jingles well, i started a lot earlier than that really so i started a lot earlier than that yeah yeah so you already had a, yeah it was, I mean, you already had like a history with writing songs by the time you got yeah. to your jingle phase the jingle years the jingle the jingle years. <laughs> uh yeah the first song i wrote I was seven and it was called punk and it was about my brother, Tim. Oh, yeah. Because he was sort of... Uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't even say he was a punk, to be honest. He was it's more like Blink-182 sort of era. Ah, uh, pop punk. So, like, pop punk. Yeah, yeah. nice. Not, not traditional punk. But he had a mohawk. Wow. And, like, a long leather jacket. Sick. Like in The Matrix. Well, this is a wild combination of people. I'm surprised there's only one song written about him. Yeah. I think that's a great start. Um, but he sort of scared me because he was so big, right? And punkish. Mm. So I started with like, "You're the scary guy, punk." Yeah. So the you first sit. song was written through fear. It was like, <laughs> "Lovely sound of loud," because the the first songs I wrote were sort of like nonsense songs because I didn't know how to string together sentences. I was pretty sure I was like autistic. Still, probably am. Like <laughs> as an adult, because I don't make the connection that things need to thread together right. and be holistic. Not that they particularly need to be in songs. You can write about anything. They can be nonsense. But my mum used to call them nonsense songs when I first started. Mm. And the lyrics were like, lovely sound of loud, don't make me too much proud. I was just trying to fill in the syllables more than anything else. Yeah. Um, hey, you get off my wall just because you're very tall. Uh, Being honest, I think that's still how most people write lyrics. Yeah, it's people like, people always aim. Da, 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 yeah. I need an E there. I need yeah, a wee. exactly. <laughs> also, it's always so strange. Like any time I think I I think too much about why we like music. It's like people really want a rhyme, but people really want the rhyme at the end of the line. They want to hear the yeah. r- the rhyme land where there's a little space at the end. It's so, so boring. The, yeah, exactly. But we're all kind of confined to that. Yeah, I mean, obviously, there's some artists that completely um, loop away from that, and that's starting yeah. to happen, especially more in hip hop where and and rap where they're using internal rhymes a lot more, so it doesn't have to. But then you'll get yeah. the rhyme at the end of the line, and it's so satisfying when it does because there is a sort of oral satisfaction mm-hmm. about uh, rhyme landing. People talk about rhymes landing at the end of the rhyme, yeah. but it's almost it is satisfying. It's yeah, exactly right. And I think it, it's not satisfying if someone's trying to squeeze in too many syllables into one line, mm-hmm. and that really irritates me actually. Yeah, uh, it's like jarring on the ears. Yeah, and hearing a rhyme at the end of the line is pretty fine. I that think. sounded great to me. Yeah. Um, My ears are very turned on right now. They're very <laughs> aroused. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's um, so. The first song that you wrote about your about your scary older brother. Yeah. Did that turn into a series of songs about family members, or where did you go from there? Mm, I, I had 
I had a few songs that I used to just write down on a piece of paper and they never end. <laughs> and I'd write really small so that I could fit them all onto an A4 piece of paper. And then I'd turn the piece of paper around and start. I was obsessed with paper when I was like <laughs> eight or nine. I was, I still am actually in oh, a yeah. weird way. I, was, I just Paper's love, great. I love a blank sheet of paper. Underrated. Because it, it is, you can put anything on there, anything you want. You truly can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know you're right. It sounds, it sounds weird. But like, well, that's yeah. A blank piece of paper is has got nothing written on it, so you can just sort of. That's the inspiration for me. Is the undone? Thinking, yeah, yeah. And I, I almost like sitting there thinking, I don't want to waste this paper. I need to put something good. To it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, but yeah, those first songs when I was about eight, I had this. I remember my mum coming home because. I'm mentioning my mum and dad a lot, I don't know why. Mm-hmm. But my mum picked me up from school and said, oh, my friend gave me a, a huge amount of paper. She said to me, do you know anyone that likes paper? <laughs> and she said, yes, <laughs> my son, he's obsessed. Like, So she brought home <laughs> this, uh, well, no, she picked me up from school and there's just this like huge stack of paper that was all joined together. Um, and they had like little dots on the top and they were all attached it wasn't like a, a sketchbook i haven't thought of this in years it's just <laughs> it's just come up now but i used to just write endless songs that never ended and words that never ended that made no sense and as i was writing them i was thinking of the melody yeah but like obviously without audacity or any means of recording anything at mm. the time i would just sort of either forget them or they kind of get lost in the ether somewhere. Yeah, well, they all exist somewhere, um, right? unless they turn into fire Yeah, or so there were, there were a lot of songs that I wrote that just went into nonsense land and just <laughs> floated off. Um, you're not the only one there. I yeah. wouldn't worry about that. But the um, when you talk about the melodies sort of coming to you, how did the melodies appear? Did you just, you just, you were writing these songs and the melodies were just sort of already coming out? Um, I would just make it up as I went along. Mm. So I would sit, I would get an album that I knew... Pardon me. I'd get an album that I knew had lots of long songs, mm-hmm. like maybe one of my dad's classical albums that had maybe 40 minutes or something. I was obsessed with numbers as well. And I'd, I'd put it on the CD player and look at and time these imaginary songs that were gone forever once, <laughs> once I'd sung them and once I'd like made up these imaginary words. And I'd just sit and make like pretend albums on us like i remember being in year six and talking to my friends and they were like you couldn't make you couldn't make a whole album and i was like i'd make 10 albums <laughs> <laughs> screw you i'm gonna make as many albums as i can i'm gonna show you uh so we- <laughs> i love that though yeah because um i think one of the first things i ever read about you probably before i met you was that you'd uh, it might have been in York Mix and you said to someone that you'd written over 500 songs or something yeah. and oh, you were yeah. probably like 18 or 19 but I love the idea that they weren't I'd imagine in my head that you recorded all of them and had all these like really orchestral arrangements for them but I love that some of them <laughs> weren't weren't even recorded some of them were just like yeah they, and, you, and, and were to never be remembered or repeated they were entirely well, that, would, that would probably add to the amount of <laughs> yeah, exactly. number of songs yeah exactly like, more than Dylan s- now yeah, I mean, Dylan has like... No one near as good, but yeah. Oh, no, I'm sure, no, Dylan's got a load of crap songs. That's the that's, oh, yeah, that's no. the joy of him. But, I kind um, of love the crap ones. So. Yeah, exactly. The um, It feels very personal, that way of creating, because a lot of people... Well, I, I, I read recently that a lot of people consider art to be a particularly cr- uh, selfish act of creation, because yeah. in sharing art, you immediately consider your, your own art worth sharing. But Whereas, that, that's how people relate. So. Yeah, I don't think it is selfish in in the long run. It's selfish at the time yeah. that you're doing it, but then you give it to someone else and they're like, oh, I feel the same way. Yeah, okay, yeah, great. And so they, that. They, then they gain something from it. Exactly, there's the act of but yeah, it's very selfish initially. <laughs> <laughs> but what you've done in these early songs is completely evade that in the sense that you were doing that just for yourself. So the songs were then yeah. disappeared well, into I always the have. Part. I think that's my biggest downfall. No, I think that's a triumph. Okay. They're entirely for yourself. It's like well, I think we we talk quite a lot on on this uh, podcast about um, how art can be very cathartic and songwriting a lot yeah. of the time can be so much more cathartic for the artist as well as then. For me, it's like therapy. That. Yeah, same. Yeah. Um, it's it's 
if I find myself in a situation that I'm un- I find unpleasant, if it's not too unpleasant, if it's like, I think if it's a really horrible situation, I probably won't write about it. But if it's just kind of sad and melancholic, I'll happily sit down and just let my feelings out onto yeah, a piano exactly. or a guitar and I'll feel a lot better. I mean, you you were talking about Tom Beer about this, weren't you? About um, how it just, you just feel a lot better. Yeah. After you've written a song in a shit situation. Definitely. Well, it gives you your own sense of understanding of it as well. You sort of yeah. didn't realise you felt that way until those words came out of you and you're like, oh, yeah. shit, I, I, I didn't realise I knew that. <laughs> yeah. I've, I, I find the song spooky when you write a song before an event mm. and then an event happens and it's scare, kind of quite scarily appropriate to the song you just wrote. Yeah. Like Neither Here Nor There on my new album. Mm-hmm. I wrote that a week before. My sister and brother-in-law broke up. All right. So that was a very sort of, kind of spooked me out. And then and my brother-in-law was listening to it, saying, I'm um, relating to every line in, in this song. And I was like, well, I don't know if I wrote it out of that, because I I wasn't in any situation with, mm. in I wasn't in any romantic situation at the time. So it definitely wasn't about me. Well, I think one of the most important songwriting tools is empathy, is trying yeah. to be able to understand about the... Um, Track and struggle with sometimes. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, I, I, <laughs> I, I, and, and I think everyone can. But I think one of the greatest tools of songwriting is also to understand that we can struggle in the same way that others can struggle and we yeah. can experience joy in the same way that others can experience joy. And that's, I think, maybe one of the joys of songwriting is that we know other people can feel these things. Yeah. It's almost like... Makes she, us feel less alone. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Complete scepticism is the idea that w- no one else exists and, yeah. uh, and the only thing that we know is that we ourselves exist. Whereas the idea mm. of, like, songwriting and relating to other people sort of makes us feel that there are other people in the world, which is a really lovely yeah. experience. And I feel like... I think the attitude of a songwriter is sort of constantly reminding yourself. Of that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we've <laughs> because, got to remind ourselves as we much can, as everyone else. Yeah, we can feel very sort of apart from everyone and isolated. Yeah, exactly. Uh, just well, everyone can feel like that. So, did you struggle to create during isolation? Not at all. No. Um, being on furlough kind of gave me complete freedom mm. to just sit around and write songs. Well, not particularly write songs, but just, like, finish songs and work on whatever I felt like. Yeah. Because I've sort of shot myself in the foot by... I mean, other people would disagree with this and say, no, it's a great thing. But uh, I've sort of put myself in the middle of four or five albums that I'm recording simultaneously. Mm. And which means that I don't finish any of them because I keep on thinking, oh, today I'll work on that one, today I'll work on this one. <laughs> like if I get bored of one yeah. and I, don't, I just don't want to go near it or I think, oh, I hate, I hate that song today, yeah. then I can just go, all right, well, I'll just work on some ambient stuff then, mm. which is nice, but I never get a finished product. So I get really frustrated that I can't just sort of focus in on one particular album and that's what Sunday Blues was that was me saying all right I'm just going to work on this one thing Mm. and sort of shove everything else aside whilst I do that yeah um and that was kind of later in lockdown I decided I was going to record the album and that I had enough songs that I built up over the past three years that was like solid enough to have like a cohesive piece of work Mm. because I'm I do have a lot of other albums, but I feel like that's probably the most accessible album. Yeah, and has, so it I feels to have a th- it has a thread. Yeah, it has, a, it has a theme going throughout it. It's not a, like a concept album, but it's yeah. it's got a certain feel, and the production is very similar mm. throughout. There was one song, the Annie Get Out of Town song. Yeah, felt like the only one that was slightly different. Still fits into the keys yeah. of the whole thing, but the mm. reverby guitar. At the start, an electric yeah, guitar, sort of, I think. Yeah, it sort of fades in quite abruptly. Mm. 
Yeah, I like. I, and then I, suddenly, I really suddenly it. gets really loud with keyboards and yeah, drums and stuff. Exactly, and the full band is the full band you. Yeah, <laughs> a, ba- a band of Saxons. Yeah, I thought so. Yeah. That's uh, and uh, yeah. six or seven of me. A band, a band of Luke's. Uh, uh, so. Uh, so I wrote while well, I was listening to the first song Drifters, which I also think is a beautiful piece of music and also a great title. Um, although it's a a band of Luke's, mm. uh, there's still a loneliness about it. I, I felt um, okay. almost as if in creating a band out of yourself, it's almost like. And I'm not saying that there's any emotional attachment to any of this but it's almost like there's a refusal a refusal to work with others though that sounds like a harsh <laughs> question but in, it's fair enough in, yeah. in 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 the in the sound of it because you're constantly being, being reminded of it, it's your voice doing all the backing vocals yeah. it's you playing all of these different parts mm. it's a very luke project whereas sometimes music is a little more communal but yeah. i really like that there's a, there's a lukeness about it yeah luke there is luke warmth you can, yeah, you, can, you can use that if you like. luke um was that the aim um, I think my um, obsession of, with control <laughs> and not being able to particularly get along with other musicians <laughs> in a band is probably why <laughs> I sort of have ended up doing everything myself. It was never, that was never the intention. It mm. just sort of ended up that way. Because any time I say, or someone else says, oh, we should get together, we should play some music. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, we probably, yeah, we probably should. And then I go, and then we sort of chat, and then we play like a couple of songs, and then we're like, should we just go and get some beer? <laughs> <laughs> it, like it never, it never turns into anything. Yeah. And I never particularly want it to, and that kind of sounds bad, but I'm just not a very good collaborator. <laughs> like I can jam with people, I can sit down and, and like riff off stuff and and have a nice time doing that but yeah. then after that i'm like yeah i think i'll go home <laughs> to my uh, comfy place and do my lonely songs <laughs> yeah well there you go so i think even you calling them lonely songs is really interesting and sort of intrinsic yeah. of the music itself because there's a joy to sort it. Of solitude songs. yeah more, exactly more like so, lonely because i'm not yeah particularly lonely when I'm, exactly. I'm in heaven when i'm on my own making songs it's really? like yeah i, I get sort of possessed Possessive, uh, possess, uh, got talking about possessive, mm. possessive. There we go. Almost. <laughs> Just gotta say so. Possessive of the song. Possessive of songs and my own time that I have making them. If someone disturbs me in that time, they get a good thrashing. <laughs> Lethally berated. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> and like, I, I become quite an unlikable person, which you might be shocked by. But, yeah. uh, that that is shocking, but that, I think that also shows how um, how much these songs mean to you. Yeah, right. I, I like, suppose it's a it's a sort of unnecessary amount of care for these songs that are just so silly and meaningless <laughs> that I care so much about. Them. <laughs> um, yeah, Sarah did some singing on the album. My oh, girlfriend. great! Uh, she sung on Mother in May. And a tiny bit on Bye Bye Love. Mm-hmm. But she got very wound up and sort of walked out oh, of no. the room. Well, not the room. She went to the other end of the room and did her own thing with headphones on and sort of ignored me because I got so controlling and, like, she would sing a line from the song and I would say, nope, you're out, start again, and just kept on doing that for about half an hour until she said, oh, I'm not doing this. Oh no, you're yeah. cruel. So I'm really upset. Her. And like we laugh about it now, it's funny. <laughs> I hope we do. <laughs> but, um, yeah, but there's, there's, there's sort of a reason why she only sings on that one song. I think we're going to try and do some more backing vocals for a few of the songs, but I just get so, like, I don't know, hammer with a nail. you gotta, you got to get it. Perfect for me. It's to be exact. Um, yeah, people who have worked with me in the past, like if I've had them on my recordings, have been very sort of, oh, God, <laughs> <laughs> like dripping with sweat from their yeah. forehead. Well, exactly. Because I'm like, nope, do it again. You did it wrong. I used to. Like, do it like this. And then I was sort of <laughs> almost patronising in a way. Uh, a while ago when I was writing and recording my own music, instead of having... Um, a female vocalist sing on my songs when I wanted a high harmony. Yeah. I'd record myself and pitch it up. 
Yeah, because, because that's I, I, nice. I wanted me to get it. I wanted me to get it right. No one else is going to do it as well as you want to do it. Well, no one. No, no one's going to dedicate the, the time as well. No one else is going to do the idea that I've specifically got in my head because yeah. it's very difficult for, for someone wants. to like net like put, do it exactly the yeah. way I want. Though I've also come to learn that collaboration can be so much more important yeah. than solitude at times. At times, I but think also, it. it I think having more people kind of gets you out of the rut because you can work yourself into a bad rut when you're just on your own, mm-hmm. especially if you're like stuck between four walls and you're doing nothing but that for weeks on end. You can just hit a wall. Yeah. And it's like, I'm not enjoying this anymore. I hate these songs now. I I don't like anything I've written. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm rubbish. You, you start saying all these yeah, things yeah, to absolutely. yourself, which... Like if someone else walked in the room, just even if they just sat and listened, they'd go, that's mint, that. Yeah, exactly. And that'll make you go, oh, yeah, it's mint. And then you just sort <laughs> But even if it was just that, but like someone coming in the room and saying, you know what, that bit just needs a kick. Mm-hmm. Like a boom, boom, boom. Or like, I don't know, just someone coming in and saying, oh, you just need some like violins in the background and that bit or something. Because it just feels a bit naked. You know, like, oh, I didn't think of that because I was thinking about some other things. Exactly. And that's so helpful. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm lucky to have my friend Jamie for that. Um, I always run my albums by him before I finish them. Mm-hmm. Unless I'm like, I don't know, sometimes I'll send it to him and say, it's done, don't tell me anything, it's done, <laughs> this is the album. But... <laughs> But sometimes I'll just say, uh, any, I'm fine with any suggestions because he's the only person I let give me suggestions, really. Like if someone says, yeah, it's just, it's like, um, I've had quite a few people say it's very calming and very relaxed and laid back and stuff, like easy listening. And I'm like, ah, oh, fuck you. <laughs> easy listening. Like I want you to, to kind of, take more from it than that. Yeah. I don't know. I've, I'm not... Like, even Burt Bacharach, I get offended when people call him easy listening. You know, yeah, exactly. There is something behind those songs. They're not just songs to go, like, tap your foot along and go, ooh, yeah. play a bit of music. It's yeah. Like, no, there's more behind the lyrics for you to discover than just, like, ooh, this is a catchy little song. So I get, <laughs> I get a bit sort of pissed off with people. And, and then like, as a result, you have, like, a small circle of people that you trust... Yeah. And to be able to listen to the music and listen to... Especially if they know where you're coming from as well. Yeah, A lot of people might not know, or they'll just say, oh, it's a bit like folky indie sort of stuff. (laughs) Never trust the Baccarat detractors (laughs) is a a difficult sentence to say. That sounds like a a good T-shirt slogan. (laughs) That's a great idea. was me chatting with Luke Saxton what a lovely lad please listen to more of his music um, which is available online on Soundcloud, on Spotify um, his new album, which I've been lucky enough to hear, like a fancy press man um, comes out towards the end of the year with no specific date yet, but it's called Sunday Blues check out his other music online, his album Sunny Sadness is on Spotify and CD, and is full of gems absolute gems as is his soundcloud but yeah that was luke saxton um the next podcast is going to be me chatting to matthew thorne who directed our music video the only boy racer left on the island uh, a music video which we're very proud to put our name to and he's a very interesting man and has a lot of interesting opinions on art and creation and goes in depth on the making of that video really cool So yeah, look out for that one.